Welcome to your YouTube channel. God bless you. You are about to listen to a message from the channel of the Almighty God and the lips of the pastor. Your blessings await you as you listen and pray along. For any inquiry, partnership and prayers, please check our YouTube page for contact as you click the select icon. Please like, subscribe and click the bell to be notified on upcoming videos. And do not forget to share. God bless you. Welcome everyone. We shall be fielding some questions based on the, uh, the Sunday school. We'll have one or two questions we'll answer. After that, we'll go right off to the message for the day. God bless you. So sister, please come up to ask your question. Thank you. Happy to be here, Pastor. Last week, you said that we should cover our entire hair. But the Bible said that our, our hair is a covering to us. So my question is that if we cover our hair, but some of our hair is still coming out, isn't still isn't it still okay? Thank you very much, sister, for the question. That's a very beautiful question. We shall be looking at the scripture like we did previously in First Corinthians chapter eleven. I'll read again verse five. First Corinthians chapter eleven. I'll read again verse five. But every woman that prayer to prophesy with her head or covered, dishonoreth her head. For this is even all one as if she were shaven. Now when somebody says a thing, you'll be looking at the intention or the import or the basis or the premises or the background of that statement. You'll be looking at the import, the origin, the source, the background, the premises. Why would this person say this? On what ground is that statement predicated or based on? So if you look at that verse keenly, but everyone, every woman that prayed or prophesied with her head uncovered, disnored her head. Now look at the head. The Bible says if the woman doesn't cover her head, she dishonored her head. Now, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. Which means, if you look at it there, in your King James, you see the column there. And the column is saying, still in verse 5, just on right her head, there's a column, for that is even all, as if she were shaving. Now, in explaining the first part of that verse, for every woman that prayed or prophesied with her head or cover, just on right her head. Now, there's the explanation. That is even all, as if she were shaving. Which means, the emphasis on the head is the hair because if the woman's hair is shaven she may not last, she won't look beautiful or attractive or comely as she ought to be okay so if your hair you are going to expose your hair you are not going to cover your head you are not going to cover your head then shave your head it's a statement of rebuke it's a statement it's a clause a kind of saying if you must do this, then if that's the case, do it like this, and that what you don't want to do. Which means the hair is critical in the art, the spiritual art, or the obligation, or the practice of a woman covering her hair while she's praying or prophesying. That is even all as if she were shaven. Shaven. How what has shaven? Shaving the hair got to do with covering the head, which means the hair. Is critical. The hair is basic. The hair is primary. It is the issue it is the cross of the woman covering the head. So the issue of you covering your head with your hair all over, scattered all over. There was the point. Was the point that it means that you're just doing a kind of routine, religious routine that doesn't even make any sense. You have your hair all over your head, all over your oh, then you put something in the middle. What's the point? What's that supposed to mean? That's not sacrifice. That's not Christian dressing. That's not Christian, ideal Christian biblical attitude towards covering your hair while the woman is praying or prophesying. If your hair is all over at the back, in the front, everywhere, and you put something in the middle, what is the meaning of that? Are you mocking God? Are you mocking the demands and the requirements of the scriptures when you are praying or prophesying? That's not a that shouldn't be a mockery. You must sacrifice because that hair was not given to you by yourself. That hair was not given to you by your parents. 
That hair was not given to you by anybody. It was given to you by the Almighty God. So what's, what is it that will take you? To take a cover, to put on your head, cover the entire hair. Cover the entire hair. H-A-I-R. Cover the entire hair with your covering. Get a cover. Cover it with your scarf or whatever it is. Cover it and respect yourself before the angels of the Almighty God as you pray and as you prophesy. That's the scripture. That's the word. Because some people misunderstand that verse. They do not understand that the emphasis is on the hair on the head. They do not understand that. And they have their hair, and some say the hair is all over the place. Let me just put something in the middle. Some will even take a paper and put it in the middle. Some will just take something around. Like anything they can see, put dead in the middle. Like, uh, I don't know. Put dead in the middle with all your hair scattered all over you. What is the meaning of that? So that's the point at the middle that the angels will look at? No. Cover your hair. It's a biblical obligation. And the Lord will touch you and the Lord will help you. I hope that answers the question, sister. Thank you very much. God bless you. Let us pray. The Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we come before you because you are the mighty God. As we come before you right now, as we study your word and open the scripture, as we hear from your throne, Lord will pray that the words will be pure and crafted the word of God will come directly from you and they will hit us, touch the people, change lives, alter character and they alter attitude and change and mold all so that we will be fit for your kingdom in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because I know that you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen, amen, and amen. You may please be seated. Today, the Lord will be speaking to us through the message, result-oriented, confidence speaking, and action in the midst of distractions. Result-oriented, confidence speaking, and action in the midst of distractions. If you look at that in the series, answer the call of the Almighty God, Part 195. If you look at that message or the topic today for this, today's discussion, it means that or there could be confident speaking, there could be confident action in the midst of distractions that may not be result oriented. So, which means that we need to look at it critically that when we have confidence in our lives as students, as business people, as businessmen or women, as spouses, as government officials, we will have confidence in our lives. And we are able to speak confidently. And we have the confident or the appropriate action. In the midst of distractions, we should know how to channel the confidence speaking and action to have results. Which means it is not every, every confidence speaking and action that can produce results. That's why we're looking at result oriented, confidence speaking, and action in the midst of distractions. Now, as we're looking at the introduction now, we'll be looking at the introduction and the references from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 28 up to verse 36. Now, we're looking at it now. We are dealing with the distractions that fight. Your result oriented, confidence speaking, and action. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 28, and Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou led those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thy heart. For thou art come down, that thou mightest see the barrow. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 29, And David said, What have I now done? What have I now done? Is there not a cause? In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 30, And he turned from him toward another, and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 31, And when the words were heard, which David speak, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail, because of him, that servant will go and fight with this Philistine. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 33, And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go, 
against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. The first Samuel chapter 17, verse 34. And David said unto to Saul, The servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamp out of the flock. In first Samuel chapter 17, verse 35. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his bed, and smote him, and slew him. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 36, the servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this was a concise Philistine, shall be as one of them, seeing he had defied the armies of the living God. A long one though, but there are a lot to learn from that verse, because we are dealing with, with the distractions that fight, the results-oriented confidence speaking and action. If you look at those verses that we have read, David, while he was talking to one of the soldiers at the war camp, his brother, his eldest brother, to be precise, called Elia, heard his conversation, his inquiry from a soldier at the war front or at the war camp, and intercepted and he reacted and said, I know you, you have showed up, you are here. To show up your pride. Why will you leave the few sheep in the wilderness? Who did you leave the sheep with? You see the limitation of man. He never knew that David was practically obedient. He never knew that. And then he interrogated David and he showed his displeasure at what David was doing. And David said, what have I done now? You know that is what a sibling or a junior brother or sister will tell the elder one. What have I done now? You have always hacked him. You're always talking to me. You're always talking down on me. You're always instructing me left to the right. What have I done now? Here at the war camp, not at home now. What have I done now? Is there not a reason why I'm doing this now? But Elia was short-sighted. He never knew that the brother that he was used to was not the brother that was talking. Sometimes we take people for granted. As well, that's my son. That's my husband. That's my wife. And that's my junior brother. That's my elder sister. That's my elder brother. And when the Lord is speaking through that channel, through that person, you'll take it for granted. You say, it's the same person. Of course, he's using his own normal sense. Not knowing that God just visited David and was speaking through him. He was asking questions. He was probing. He was negotiating for his greatness. And the brother heard, is he not David at home that, 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 that I sent on errand? Hey, this small boy, this small boy, I'm coming here to ask my mates about the world. What's this boy saying? Go and take care of the few sheep in the wilderness. They are coming here to show off. You see, that is why we should distinguish familiarity from friendship. When you are over familiar with somebody, you will not understand the blessings God has put in that person for your life. Friendship is the key because familiarity could be something that you do from a distance, something that you don't probe in depth, something that you don't know the person too well. You greet the person, you say hi, hi, hello, hello, and you discuss normal official things, normal artificial things, things that, are, that don't have no depth. You discuss, I will call that familiarity, but when the person is a friend, you want to ask the person how you feel. You want to ask the person, what is it today? What are you thinking? What's your take on that issue? What's your take on that on this other issue? When the person is a friend, you want to confide in the person your, your thoughts, and you want to speak to the person, you want to be intimate with the individual. And when the person knows that you are a friend, you may begin to understand God's call upon that life, what that person can do beyond the normal, beyond the physical, you see. What we can read in that verse, it means that Eliab and David had a kind of familiar relationship. It means the relationship between Eliab and David was a kind of familiar relationship, not friendship relationship, even though he was the elder brother, even though he was a junior brother. Because if the relationship was not a familiar relationship, he would have understood the anointing that was given to David, laid or put upon his head, was working on something. And that that anointing was for a purpose. Perhaps he would have called David to say, Ah, brother, uh, I don't understand. Why are you asking? Uh, is something there in the offing? Is there something I need to understand? Because ever Samuel anointed you, I'll be watching, waiting to see 
the demonstration, the evidence of that kind of anointing. But he never said that. Rather, he was rebuking David as he would do normally at, way back at home. Go, if you really want to be blessed, if you really want to be blessed from a source, from an individual that is close to you, legitimate individual. I'm not talking about a man and a woman that are not related by blood. Uh, so you see that this man is over there. It's not related by blood. It's not your brother and it's not your husband. And then you go close to the person because you feel the pastor said that you benefit more when you are a friend. No, I never said so. Legitimate, pure relationship. You will benefit more when there's friendship rather than familiarity. It's key. It's key. And it is very, very key. Now, not only that, you look at the perspective also. We won't have the wrong perspective about other people. We may not gain it, benefit more from such people. Wrong perspective will lead to wrong conclusion about the individual. Now, look at the case of David. Look at Eliab. There at the war camp, because it was his junior brother, because it was David, not someone else, the perspective already had about him is a, a perspective of errant going, errant boy. The perspective of always being with the sheep. Nothing more you can do. If there's anything to be done in this family, it has to be before because I'm the first child. And so anything about strength that would demand strength, anything that would demand intelligence, anything that would demand whatever, I am the one first. When you have the wrong perspective about people, you may not be able to get the best from them. Therefore, it is important that you correct your perspective. Correct your perspective. We're not saying that David did not have his own flaws as a normal person, as a normal member of his family, of Jesse's family. He may have his own flaws. He may have his own weaknesses. No, natural weaknesses, not sinful weaknesses. He may have them, but that wrong perspective that he had at home, he took it to the official ground. And that, uh, he never knew that David was negotiating his greatness. Now look at this now. Not only that, even when David was hushed up by the eldest brother, Eliab. He went on and he asked the brother, what have I done now? Which means sometimes at home, uh, David faced a kind of a kind of a kind of questioning that that well, doesn't make sense. What have I done now? Which means sometimes back at home, though the Bible did not record, Eliab will always want to intercept David, and they will always have questions to answer before the eldest brother. And so he said, What have I done now? Is that the reason why I'm asking? Of course, you know that was a youth. And he was like almost the youngest among the people standing there. He was talking from an authority. He was talking from an innate authority, an inner strength. He was talking confidently. He was not, he was not swayed by the brother's inter interruption. He went on from the other soldier to the other soldier asking the same thing. You know what David was doing? He was trying to be sure that this my greatness is guaranteed. If I deploy the anointing that I have, what will be my benefit? Because you see, every anointing that the Lord gives to you, whatever power the Lord gives to you, any specific anointing or instruction he gives to you, there's a specific blessing that will also come with that kind of instruction. He knew he had the anointing. He was not talking like the normal David. He had the confidence. The grace of God was in his heart. What could petrify? What could make the, the chief, the commander-in-chief of the armed forces of Israel to be afraid? What could make everyone in that army to be afraid. David, even though he was the youngest there, was not swayed, was not afraid, was not petrified. He was not like saying, who is this, this giant Goliath? He will eat me up, he will break me to pieces, to smithereens. No, he was not scared. It means that there was an elevation of strength within him. That's what power from a high can do for us. That is what anointing can do for us. Not only that. And then David left the place. When the Israelite soldier saw what David was doing and the way he was asking the question from one soldier to the next soldier, the report reached the chief, the commander in chief of the armed forces of Israel, King Saul. And then he sent for David. David never went to the king. He sent for David and said, Look at you, you're just a youth. In other words, you don't have all the Moses that this man that has been trained from his youth, he grew up from his youth, in the perspective of the king. That Goliath grew up and trained himself as a warrior from the youth to this point where he is now. You're just a youth tendering the sheep in the, in the wilderness over there. And then David had to face some questions before the king and declared himself, if God will deliver the, my, my, my lamp for the sheep, for the lion and for the bear, that same God that did that, that thing will do it in a larger sphere. That is how we grow again our spiritual lives. You don't just come to the big stage. 
to pronounce a word, to say something God spoke, God said, when you are not tested that same voice in minor issues in your house, minor issues around you. If you want to test God's peace, God said at the bigger stage, and then test it too at a minor level of your life. And when you test it and check if God actually spoke to you, or your mind that spoke, or your senses that spoke, you don't come to the big stage and say, God said, because at the very minutest detail in your environment, it wasn't God that spoke to you. David tested the power of God and the grace of God upon his life with the lion and the bear. And he delivered his lamp. And he knew at that stage in the wilderness, if God could do that, that same God who is forever faithful. At the bigger stage now, representing the entire nation, he would defeat Goliath. He represented his family. He represented the children. He represented the family at that level. And he excelled. And now he knew the God who made him as the least of them all to represent Jesus' family and was able to wrestle or was able to deliver the lamb from the lion and the bear will make him be the champion as he represented the whole country before the king. The confidence was there. There was no fear in his heart. How would you know that God wants you to do something? He will give you strength. He will give you grace. What petrify other people? What will make them to be afraid will not make you to be afraid. Your heart will be steady. Your perspective about what every other person is saying about that thing may not even be your own perspective. Everybody will say, will say this thing about this thing. This is the fear about this. That is the fear. But you will not have it. Why? Because you know God has destined you for that cause. And the Lord will touch you and the Lord will help you and I. The Holy Spirit wishes to speak to us in two points. Point number one, familiar distractions against powerful move of greatness. Familiar distractions against powerful move of greatness. Point number two, failed demonstration against prominent move of greatness. If you look at point number one right there, familiar distractions against powerful move of greatness, which means Whenever we want to do something that will elevate us, that will give us elevation of our social economic status, whenever we want to do something that will take us from ground zero uh, to ground four, ground five, and uh, take us to, to a very high level, there are familiar, common distractions that we always want to fight against us. Whenever we want to do something that will take us from ground zero to ground four or to a higher sphere of life, there are common distractions, familiar distractions that we always want to fight that kind of move. If we do not understand, that take every step you take towards your greatness may be challenged by either your family members or by your mind or by the devil. You may soon give up on your dreams. You will soon give up your dreams. At point number two, failed demonstration against prominent move of greatness. Now, when you are insistent, you are persistent, you are resolved, you are dogged, and you mean exactly what you want to do. You know the direction you are headed and you are not dissuaded. And you do not even think about what somebody is saying because you are convinced about that direction you are headed. Then all the demonstration against that will be defeated. Not only that, whatever it is that will come up from there, you will be able to contain. Let's go to point number one right away. Familiar distractions against popular move of greatness, which I'll be looking at first Samuel chapter 17, verse 28, right on to verse 30. We'll look at it there. And Eliab, first Samuel chapter 17, verse 28, and Eliab his eldest brother head, when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? With whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thy heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the barrow. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 29, and David said, What have I now done? What have I now done? Is there not a cause? In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 30, And he turned from him toward him, and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. Now, your family may kick against your vision in life. Never mind. Keep on your resolve. Keep your resolve untouched. If you are persuaded to carry on with your vision, it's very critical that you see in those verses we have read, we we'll learned there, that even though that the eldest brother kicked against David, the other people kept on answering him. And you look at that now, your family may kick against your vision in life. And we admonish that we should never mind. We should be persuaded to continue that which we have started. And then we'll come and great. We shall look at the crisis in, in negotiation for your greatness. Your crisis. 
crisis in negotiation for your greatness. We have looked at 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 28 to 30 a while ago. Now the crisis, if you look at it now, there, he was negotiating for his greatness. He wanted to be sure. He was the highest and the best and only bidder. All the people that bidded, all the soldiers that bidded before their king, none of them could stand before Goliath. None of them was bold enough to stand before Goliath. So he was the only succeeding bidder for the contract, so to speak. He was the only succeeding bidder for the proposal. He had the proposal with him. He wants to move from the level where he was to something higher. So he needed to be sure of what he was doing. So whatever we are doing in life today, let's apply it now. Whatever you are doing as a student, as a business person, as married couples, always be sure. Ask questions. It's critical. Ask questions because if you do not ask questions, you may not be able to contend or resolve the unprecedented events that may follow after. Because you are in a course to somewhere. You will never can tell. Maybe you are driving now. You are driving to destination A. You are moving from destination A to destination B. And as you are going, you never check your tank, whether you have enough gas or have enough fuel. You never checked your tires, whether they were properly gauged. You didn't even look at your plugs, whether they, there's a disconnection. And then you hop into the vehicle and then off you went. And then along the line, the vehicle stopped. And you looked at your tank, you look at you think it was short of fuel. Because you never ask questions. In asking questions in that regard is to check your vehicle, go around to see if the tires are in place and you check everything, everything is in order. So when you are proposing, you are out for a business venture, whatever it is you are doing as a student, you are out to write an exam, ask questions. How do you ask questions? Prepare adequately. Know exactly where you are headed. Check all the topics that are relevantly suited for that exam. And if it's a business thing, ask questions about the business. Have good knowledge, at least a contribute knowledge about that business. At least 80% knowledge about that business. Ask questions. Ask questions about the organization. Ask questions. Because you see, David was asking questions. From one soldier to the next soldier, and maybe in our time, <laughs> maybe I would have just asked one soldier, is that what is obtainable here? That you said the king will give the daughter to be married out, and well, my father's house will become free in the land of Israel. Is that what I will get? Okay, that's fine. Since I've heard from you now, and then I will just tell the people, this is what I want to do, take me to the king. David never did that. From one person to the next person. And look at the crisis here. Even when he was doing that, somebody was supposed to lend him support was opposing him. None of the soldiers knew that uh, Prophet Samuel had anointed David. Do you know what it means for the national prophet to come to your father's house? To anoint the least of the children. I expected that Eliab would have or put an eye on David to see when the manifestation of such anointing was start. Rather, he opposed David, even the cost of David negotiating for his greatness. You know one thing? David was not deterred despite the distraction. David was not deterred Despite his brother's interruption, David still went ahead. That's why you see sometimes we are discouraged by our family people, our family members. You have this drive and you have this dream. And people out there will buy your dream. And they will say this is very, very wonderful. And you want to confide in your brother, your sister. It could be elder, it could be your sibling, it could be junior. And then you will understand that this person knows your potential at home. Since you live most of the time of the day with him or her. And instead of her to proffer solution or to cushion the effort or to, to boost her the, the vision or to encourage you along that path, uh, rather what she will say, is it not you? You that didn't sleep well last night, you didn't wake up early enough. You, is it not you? And uh, you that were, were talked to like this and then you will do like this. Uh, because of those things, the normal things that you see with your brother or sister, you're talking down, not knowing that sometimes the, the, the extraordinary is achievement it's not based on the, on the natural weaknesses of the person, on the familiarity of the person that you know. Uh, there's a greater force from the Almighty God that will descend upon that person that you think that is very weak in your assessment. And God may want to use that person for a greater feat in life. And so you don't look at people and judge them by the things, by the failures that are characteristics with them. You look at the fellow that, that is characteristic with this person. I know the weakness of this individual. I know the strength. I know the bounds. I know where he can function. He will not be able to do this and do that. I've been the one helping him all out behind the scenes. So he can't function in this capacity. But I is God and you are God. He may have been called 
to function in that capacity way beyond your imagination. Eliab taught as a first child, and together with other two of his brothers there in the army, David was nobody. He had no strength. He had no calling. He had no one. His duty was to stay with the sheep over there in the wilderness. The duty was to do the errands. Okay? And so he was there. The big boy. The great boy. The huge boy. And he, everything that needs to be done in Jesus' family should pass through this uh, endorsement. It must be endorsed. It must pass through. It must come in and go out. The ingress and the egress must go through as the eldest of the children of Jesse. But God doesn't look at it that way. That biologically, you are the first child, second child. Achievement and great achievement can come from the least even before the first. It can come from the first before the least. It can come from the one in the middle before the first or the last. However it is, it is the choice of the almighty God. David waded through that crisis. The very bitter crisis of his own eldest, bro eldest brother. In the middle of, the, of his negotiation for his greatness, other soldiers were listening to him. Other soldiers were paying heed to whatever he was asking because they were not familiar with him. And so, but his eldest brother that should support him opposed him in the middle. But yet, he kept on negotiating for his greatness. Ignore the brother. He didn't talk down his brother. He didn't say, why are you talking to me like this now? What have I done now? Okay, fine. You know, you think, you think, you think because you're my eldest brother. You think because you bully me at home, so to speak. I never said he bullied him at home. They think because you command me and uh, order me around in the house, and now you are coming here now to embarrass me. Just shut, just shut. Where were you when Professor May anointed, anointed me? Where were you? Eh? You think because you are bigger and taller than me, I have God's grace more than you do. And uh, uh, in short, as a matter of fact, I spoke to the Almighty God yesterday. He never said that. In humility, he only said, What have I done now? Is that not the cause? Don't you see what I'm doing? There's a reason for it. There's a reason for it because you know why? Something was speaking through that David. It was being prepared. And the prayer points for you and I are, let us pray to ignore family distractions and achieve our goals. Let us pray to carry out our good socioeconomic negotiations without falling for any opposition. Second green. In Daniel chapter 5 verse 12, for as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding interpreting, interpreting of dreams and shewing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel whom the king Nay, pay the treasure. Now let Daniel be called. I will show the interpretation. You see the gift that was embedded in Daniel as we read in that verse. Excellent spirit dwelt in his life. He had knowledge, repertoire of knowledge, avalanche of knowledge. He had understanding, the interpretation of dreams. And he had, he can decode and encode sentences. And then he can dissolve that. It is our doubt. What can you not say more about Daniel? In all of those kind of qualities, spiritual qualities, scientific qualities, mathematical qualities, social, economic qualities, a one man called Daniel, the grace of God was upon his life, and those such gifts should be evidential in our lives today. And that gift is replica in a measure in the life of David here as we speak. He attended to earlier that was opposing and he put him where he belongs, in a few succinct statements or words. What have I done now? Is there not a cause? And that was the end. The Bible did not record that Eliab went on with David to say, Get out of this place now. Move out of this place now. Shut down there. Kneel down there. Get out there before I open my eyes. You are gone. No. Eliab's spirit was hushed up by those succinct words, by those terse words, by those brief words. What have I done now? Is there not a cause? They calm down. He has dissolved the doubt. It was like Daniel. He dissolved the doubt. He went to the other king, other person. He spoke and asked the same thing, and they will answer. And the witness, when the eldest brother spoke to him, and normally you will see, your eldest brother has spoken to you. And so, what are you still asking me questions for? Please obey your elder brother. Are you not obedient? Don't you know it's Eliab, one of our foot soldiers here? Don't you leave this place now? They never did that to David because they dissolved our doubt too. If they still went on and asking and responding to him, as though nothing happened, which means David stood like a great brother. David stood dissolving a doubt. David stood with so much knowledge. David stood so much anointed. And then you see, after that, they, even the soldiers, they went to report to the king and said, look at somebody, a youth, a small boy. And look at the way he's answering. And even when the brother hushed him up, look at the way he answered. No wonder, no wonder King Saul sent for him. And even when King Saul 
put questions before David. Ah, you, you don't have any training as a youth. That man, Goliath, had been training the entire time from his youth up to this point. How can you find such a man? Yet David went there and dissolved the doubt of the king. And he told the people, let no heart feel anybody. Let nobody be, asked, be scared about this man. I will dissolve the doubt of the entire nation. I will put him where he belongs because he deserves a doubt like Daniel. That is also point number two. Failed demonstration against prominent move of greatness. In 1 Samuel 17, verse 31, and when the words were heard, which David speak, they rasped then the false Saul and they sent for him. In 1 Samuel 17, verse 32, and David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. The servant will go and fight with this Philistine. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 33. And so said to, to David, Thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. In first Samuel chapter 17, verse 34. And David said unto Saul, The servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. In first Samuel chapter 17, verse 35. And I went out after him and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his bed and smote him and slew him. And in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 36, the servant slew both the lion and the bear. And these of circumcised Philistines shall be as one of them, seeing they have defied the armies of the living God. Now, when you are determined to achieve your dream in life, all the odds against your success will fall before you. Well, because you are determined, David was determined. So all the odds of success. All the things that will go against his success, they all fell before him. The brass opposition fell before him. And the people, all that soldiers that he was asking questions, they never looked down on him. He never said the social status, uh, quite younger than every, every one of them, was scared, the people not to answer him. All the odds fell before him. Are you going to an exam and you said you are not adequately prepared or you do not know this or you do not know that? All the odds will fall before you if you are determined to succeed. Are you going for a business proposal? And then you are going there to the negotiation table and you look at it, every other bidder had maybe some certain advantage over you in that bidding uh, boardroom or in that conference. And then all the odds will fall before you because of your determination, because you are insistent, you are persistent. It's key. Whatever it is that you are looking for as a, as a family person, whatever is it you are looking for as, a, as an official, whatever is it you are driving at, whatever it is that you are looking for. Now, the critical issue is this. When your determination is sustained, you refuse to give up on your dreams. All the odds that would have acted against you, number one, inadequate preparation, number two, I'm not better than other people. Their papers are more comp comprehensive than mine, and they may not consider my business transaction or proposal. All the odds against you, I'm not better off than the other person. Look, this person, he has this advantage over me. All those odds that would have fought against your success will fall before you. Because you know what? You are determined to succeed. David was determined to succeed. He ignored the ignored the interference of his brother and he hushed him up with God's given words out of his lips. And then all the people never looked at him like that, the way the brother presented him before them. They never looked at that. They attended to him as though it was a very serious person. And surely it was very serious. We shall be looking at your small negotiation can snowball into a big negotiation for your greatness. Your small negotiation was snowball, will rise. Meteoric rise, meteoric rise like a meteor. It will rise, snowball. It will snowball into a bigger negotiation for your greatness. That's what happens. Because we'll look at it there again. We we'll read the verses there from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 31 up to 36. What happened there? You'll see that it was rehearsed. Everything that David did before the people, before the army, all the inquiries that happened, somebody went to the king to rehearse everything and told him everything that happened, that this young man was asking one soldier to the next soldier. Earlier, the eldest brother at home, it had been trying to interfere. This man was so confident. There's something about him. And then the king sent for him. Now, look at this now. Are you listening now? Now, David started the negotiation with the army. He started with the soldier in the army, asking questions. That was the smaller sphere of his negotiation. And are you looking at something that you want to achieve in a bigger sphere? You start in a small way. And then from your small negotiation, it led, it led him to a bigger negotiation with the king. That was the highest office in, on the, in the land. The highest office in the land. The office of the president. The office of the first citizen of the land. 
the office of the chief, the commander in chief of the armed forces of Israel. It started with one soldier to the next soldier, and then it think that negotiation snowballed, meteoric rise. It moved from that now to the king, to the palace before the people. And then you know, at the, the king's palace, you will see the people protecting the king, and all the soldiers will be there, and all of that. It was brought before the king. Who told you that that little thing you are doing will not take you to you? Of meteoric rise will not take you to the highest point of your career. Who told you that effort you put in every morning and afternoon as a student trying to read something, understand something, and to do something, and nobody recognizes you will not take you to the stadium in life? Who told you that little paper that you wrote, like a proposal to seize this and to do that and uh, to propose for this kind of business, that thing you did it on your system will not take you to the stadium, will not take you to a very high point of your life. Who told you the little prayer that you pray, that you pray every morning, that you do every evening, will not bring you before the Almighty God and there will be an answer to your prayers. And when the answers come like an explosion, you begin to ask yourself, how did it happen? When did I pray? When did I fast? But you have forgotten the little prayer of God, this, 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 one second, the morning, afternoon and evening, lock up together and then there was an explosion of answer that will come to you. It was negotiation on the smaller level with one soldier to the next soldier, and then to the king, the highest and the first citizen in the land of Israel. So we start from a little point, and then you take up there. So your little or your beginning was small, the later end shall greatly increase. That's what the Bible says, and that's what happened to David, and not, not only like that. Who told you that when you discuss to the human resource manager of that establishment, maybe you are going for a business proposal, and you are here with your paper, you want to see the human resource personnel, and then you discuss to the human resource personnel with such incisive questions and wisdom. And then who told you that you, that will not lead you to the chief executive officer of that same organization? You start from a point. You may discuss with the staff of the organization. Who told you that will not snowball or match, that will not snowball or increase or take you from that discussion with the staff of that organization to see the chief executive officer of that organization or we'll start from somewhere. But sometimes we we'll make this mistake. We we'll want to go and see the chief executive officer right away. We we'll want to go and pitch everything. We want to get it at the point. We we'll want to go cut all the all the processes and want to get at the point. And then sometimes it doesn't work that way. Look at it now. He spoke to the soldiers in the war front. He spoke to the soldiers in the war camp. And one of them took and rehearsed everything to the chief executive officer. I want to get to a place, maybe an organization, you get to the gate, and somebody's asking, where are you headed, sir? I want to see the chief executive officer. And in short, the owner of this place, that's the person I can speak with. Sometimes that approach may be wrong. Uh, you want to see the chief executive officer or the managing director or the owner or the founder of this establishment? That's a good idea. A negotiative for greatness, but you can start from that security officer. You can the lobby with the security officer. Oh, security officer, how are you doing today? My name is Susu and So, and I'm from Susu and So. You look good. I like the way you are looking. That's wonderful. I like your duty post. Ah, wow. And you give some kind of uh, friendly smile, and he listens to you, and he'll ask you, why are you here, sir? Uh, you're so loving a person. I can hear you speak to me now. And then you divulge. This is exactly what I actually want. And is there is this possibility here? And you never can tell. Oh, sir, don't worry. I will direct you to someone. He gives you a contact to somebody else you will speak to. Not the chief executive officer. Not even the managing director. Not the owner of the establishment. And he goes to that person's office. Oh, sir, you look good. You're wonderful. I, I was just directed from the security officer. And uh, he said, uh, the, I mean, the person at the gate. And he said, I can speak to you. And I, just looking at you, I know I can actually open up to you. You never can tell. The person takes you to the owner of the establishment. And you get what you want. But no, when you get to the chief, to the chief security officer of the company or the gates man, you say, no, you are too small to talk to. Take me to the owner of the place that the person can talk with you are too, you are too minor. Come on, don't, I mean, you are too small. He will tell you, sir, there's no entrance into this place today. Or he allows you to go in. You meet somebody else that will tell you, you can't see the CEO today. What happens? But you never can tell. The gates man, the chief security officer of the organization has a deal with somebody else that will lead you over there. And he will say, it is serious minded persons you will give my contact to. Or serious people that will give us problems, don't give the person my contact. You never can tell. So you see, David started with a soldier. One inquiry to the next inquiry. And he had his crisis moments. 
And then from there, what happened? These same soldiers took the matter to the chief, commander-in-chief of the armed forces, and then he was called upon to answer questions before the entire country because he was speaking to King Saul, therefore he was standing and talking to the entire country, so to speak. That's how it goes. It's very, very important that we do not ignore people on our road to our greatness. And about we're looking at it, the progressive negotiation of David, because it was progressive. Equiry like this, brother attacked him with words, and he never gave up. Next inquiry, it was progressive. Now, let's look at the characteristic of the progressive negotiation of David, number one. From speaking to a lower socioeconomic status personnel, he went to a higher socioeconomic person. Now, look at it. Soldier, you can just suppose the soldier with the commander of the chief, commander in chief of the armed forces. You can't just suppose or compare a soldier to their king. You can't just suppose a personnel, a minister, a governor to the president of an entire country. You can't compare a local government chairman or a district council uh, leader to the president of the entire country. You see, it started from there, and now he was discussing with somebody else, number two. Covenants is providing the required answers to the king. The king has some questions, and yet he had the confidence. He didn't have this kind of fear that, ah, what would the king do now? Sir, before I talk to you, let me call for Jesse, my father. Oh, please, can you send for um, Eliab in the army or whatever? Let me call somebody else to stand with me. He was very confident talking to the king because he has been tra has trained himself with the people at the low level. He has said it over and over again that he can do this now. And then, number three, opportunity to give an elaborate narrative of the presence of the Almighty God in his life. Now, he didn't have the opportunity to do that when he was making his negotiations with this uh, soldier. Now, he had had the opportunity to tell the king, you know what, some time ago, the lion and the bear came from the lamp, and God empowered me, and I rescued my lamb from the lion and the bear. And so God who did that for me will take down that, that Goliath. That was a concise Goliath. That defied the army of the Lord. He had the opportunity of doing more narratives. So you see, when you are doing your negotiation progressively, you have the opportunity of giving details of what you can do. Now, watch this now. Here's the key. Here's the key. You listen to me now. When he was talking to the Israeli army, when you are talking to the gate man, the security man at that establishment that you want to go and get, submit that your business proposal. When you are on the verge of trying to get to the point of your career, you do not divulge everything that you have done. Otherwise, they will see it as though you are boasting. You don't get to the security man or the pointing or the person at the gate of the company you are trying to negotiate with and say, well, I'm here for this now, you know. I did this in social place and I got this one. I thought I did. I, no, 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 no. You just tell the person, this is why I want to see the chief executive officer to be able to submit my proposal, to be able to achieve this and achieve that. You end there. But when you get to the main person, when he got to the king, he now opened up his mind and said, look, sir, to prove to you that I'm not just a youth, that I'm not a man of war, I'm not just another youth, look at what God did for me. He rescued my lamb from the lion and the bear some time ago. And God who did that will do it again. He told the king, he didn't tell the soldiers. He told the king, he didn't rebuke Eliab to say, didn't you know what God did for me at that time? He never said so. He was not prideful. Rather, he kept on insisting, what will the king do for the person that will take down the Goliaths? He kept on insisting. He kept details to himself. But when he got to the main person, you open up his mouth and explain for that. And then that is how we should do things. Are you preparing for an exam or whatever it is that you want to do? Don't run your mouth from the very beginning. You talk about the main things. You discuss topics with other people, associates, you know. You read and do stuff. But what you will release, what you will do, your ability that you will do on the door of the exam, you explode and you do it and you get the result. Not only that, are you trying to get into a business and want to get the proposal rightly done? You don't from the beginning start talking to people and giving unnecessary information to people that do not that are not relevant to that business proposal. But when you are not called upon to defend it and you are with the main people in that boardroom, you cannot defend it. Or yeah, over the phone, online, or whatever or physical, you cannot defend and give certain achievements that you have done in time past. Also, so that they, you will not be misconstrued. And they say, this guy, this man is boastful of what he has done before because those people, they are not the end um, assessor or people that were 
were paying the signature for the acceptance of a business proposal. So that's how it works. They kept the narrative, the deeper narrative, before they kept it away from the soldiers, away from the brothers, elders, brothers, before the people. But when he saw the king, the highest authority, he opened up. And not only that, the testimony of intervention, it helped David to, to testify of the goodness of God in his life. Don't forget, at that time, King Saul was a bastarding worshiper of the Almighty God. He had issues that he hadn't settled. He had issues that were before him that he was not responding to before the Almighty God. But that David used the opportunity to testify the goodness of God in his life. And I begin to wonder what would have, rolled, what would have uh, you know, you know, run through the mind of King Saul. In his mind, you say, well, this is a faithful youth coming up serving the Lord. I was there before. But now, I've lost it all. But what can I do? And that, not only that, enhancement of a deeper relationship with this king. That's, that's number five now. Enhancement of a deeper relationship with the king. Now, during the course of the interaction, there was this kind of relationship. You're a young man. You're not a man of war like Goliath. From the youth, Goliath had been trained to be a man of war. You are just a young man. You've been a shepherd for a while. And now how can you fight with bow and arrow and fight with all these things with this man that's so huge? There was, in, there, was, there was an interface. There was discussion. King Day was talking as though he was talking to his mate, talking to his fellow king, talking to maybe the highest person in his army. You know, he was talking out, flying with a little child, quite somebody quite younger than him. There was a relationship between him and the king, number six, strengthening of his spiritual convictions and faith in the Almighty God, who can do all things. As David testified before the king, his own faith was threatened. His own faith was threatened. And I'm sure it was an indirect message to King Saul also. You look at these six characteristics. Number one, I said, from speaking with a lower socioeconomic status personnel to a higher socioeconomic higher personnel. Number two, confidence in providing the required answers to King Saul's questions and resolving his doubts. Number three, opportunity to give an elaborate narrative of the presence of God in his life, or for testimony or the intervention of the Almighty God in his life. Number five, enhancement of deeper relationship with the king. And number six, strengthening of his spiritual convictions and faith in the Almighty God. What more, more convincing more than that? You see, you are talking about somebody who is quite younger. If you want to put them on the scale like 100 to 1, and you say you can use one to defeat a 100 if you are scaling them, what more convincing? That must be very spiritual talk there. It's like somebody is telling you, um, can you can you can you fly an aeroplane? And you have not even driven a car before, and you say I can fly an aeroplane. Everybody will run away from you. That was the point. You are going to fight a man. You times three times ten times you are huge, very big, higher than you in everything, had experience, had experience, and had everything. And you say, I will take him down. And Saul so wanted to be sure. What can be more convincing than that? And the Lord will touch you and I. Everything that I've learned today about David is symbolic. You need to sit down on your own and apply everything at the Lord. The Lord, the Lord has given us tips now. The Lord has given us tips on how to go about our business proposals, on how to see the highest person going through the gates and going through other lower personnel. The Lord has given us tips also on how not to give up on our dream, despite families' uh, discouragement and people that know you too well. The Lord has given us tips also that we should not allow familiarity, no, not to make us um, short-sighted, not to see the potentials in other people. And when we, I will take away familiarity, I will bring in pure, legitimate friendship. That's when we understand the potential of other people. And the prayer points for you and I are, let us pray to be consistent with our convictions. Let us pray to be lifted up above our shortcomings. So let's action point number one. Do not give up on your dreams. So let's action point number two. Your consistent Confidence and commitment will lead to the fulfillment of your dreams. Please, an action point number three, be watchful to avoid any distractors on your way to greatness. Please, an action point number four, keep focus on your life's goals. Please, an action point number five, when you stand before the king, keep saying what you have been saying that brought you to the king. And the question is, are you consistently committed to the righteous goals in life? Now, that's the question. Now, before we go to the question, there's one critical thing I need to remind you of. When you see somebody always talking down on you, bringing you down, even when you try to say what is right, ignore the person, the person is distracted on your line. You look at Eliab and David. And because he was consistently talking down on David and consistently sending him on errands, there was this undue familiarity with David. He never knew the potentials of what he actually do. And he brought it to the podium, up to the stadium. And he brought it before other people, trying to deride him also. He ignored Eliab. 
when you try to raise up something that is very potent or that are very, very crucial to you and the person who always wants to make you disbelieve in your dream, look away from that person since it is on in your life. You say something very, very key and know this is very critical in your life and the person tries to make it look as if what you are saying, you are not right. It's a distraction in your life. You know, just imagine earlier bringing what you used to, what you know David for, and then in the public place saying, I know you and your pride. You just want to come and see the battle. What's the problem with you? And talking to the people, and then I see, and David said, what have I done now? Because you can imagine what may have been happening. David cannot come before Elia to say, this is what I want to do. This is what happened. And that is what happened. Elia will always say, you shut up. You're always full of pride. You want to ask questions. And then it hurts. When you come before somebody and you are saying something very, very important and relevant, and the person wants you to doubt what you are saying, that's a distraction in your life. And the key that the Bible gives to us there is in dealing with such people, and they will make you feel as if you don't know what you are saying or what you are doing, is that just pray for words from the Holy Spirit. What have I done now? Is there not a cause? And you ignore that person and still go ahead to do what your decision, what you want to do. Don't allow the earlier of your life distract David. Because most of us, if we're in the position of David, as soon as Eliab has made David to disbelieve in what he was doing, he would have given up on his dream instantly. He would stop the talk. That motivation he had to express his inner feelings to the people, Eliab would have hushed him, would have kept quiet and said, okay, sir, I've heard, I'm going home. That's why people's dreams are shot, are caught today by people that will always want you to disbelieve what you, you know something so well. You know this is exactly what it is. And the person you are talking to, the person like this, will be telling you, it will make you want to doubt yourself. It's a distraction in your life. Don't allow the earlier of your life take away your dream or take away your conviction. Stay put, no matter what the earlier in your life is telling you. Stay put with your dream. Don't give up on your dream. It's very critical. And you, consistently committed to the righteous goals in life, despite the earlier in your life, are you still consistently committed to the righteous goals in your life? This side, the elder will tell you all the 10 things you have told me. Nine, they are wrong. Only one may be correct. And that one is subject to scrutiny. Will you now give up on your dreams because the elder of your life do not want to help you to push in it or cushion it? Oh, no. Are you consistently committed to righteous goals in life? Before we round up this message today, we'll go to the mirror of the word of God. We'll start from letter A again. And this deals with immoral sins. In Revelation 21, verse 8 abominable, sexually immoral, shall have their part in a lake of lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now look at immoral sins here. We're looking at the fornication. We're looking at the emotional adultery. We're looking at the lust. We're looking at the sodomy, the same-sex marriage, the homosexuality, the bestialism, the seduction, the twerking of all forms, the online and physical prostitution, the sugar daddy and sugar mommy practice, the masturbation, the pornography, all of these things are sexual sins, the fornication, a relationship between you that is not married to the next person, the adultery, a relationship between you and you are still looking at other people that are not married or they are married. What's your problem? Because you are never content with the evil spirit in your heart and your life. We will always want to push you out to embarrass you and to put you into bondage so that you have something to tell God and say you are not qualified for eternity, the emotional adultery. You are not doing anything practically with this person, but you are emotionally tied to adultery with this person. Each time you sit down, you imagine all kinds of things, all kinds of despicable evil things about that person. You are not having touch with the person, but you are just imagining things about that person, things you can, awful things you cannot say with your mouth. That's emotional adultery. And then uh, the, the lost him. You are always thinking, always thinking you are full of loss. If God is to estrange you and to publicize what goes on in your thoughts and for all the whole world to hear, you will hide your heart for the next 360 years. If I tell you, you will still be on earth then. You will stay in your heart for the next 10 years. You won't come out because the dirtiness of your heart will be exposed. Or oh, the lost thing. And then the sodomy, the same sense marriage. You can imagine a man saying his, his wife is a man. The woman says his husband is a, is a man. I don't understand. A man is marrying a man and a woman is marrying a woman. And you see people across the world, some countries that are passing as a bill that say says marriage is allowed. What evil have they turned this world into? Oh, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. From the creation of the world and from the blueprint of the creation of the world, the Lord never did that. He created Adam and Eve. And then after that, he fell. The procreation has always been between the opposite. It's heterogeneous. It has always been between the opposite sexes. But now, the devil said, no, I must act against the order of God. Because I'm the 
the, 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 I'm the one opposing his good works. I must act against him. And so he say, a put in the minds of people, okay? Man to man, woman to man. And they will say, have feelings. Even science even talks against it. We don't know how it is. Whether the woman will create a womb, I don't know. The man becomes a, will have a womb, I don't know. Even in magnetism, as a science person, like poles do what? Like poles repel. Unlike poles attract. It's supposed to be an attraction between the man and the woman into marriage, not attraction between a man and a man. And when that goes against even fundamental science principles and goes against fundamental biblical injunction, it means that this must be from the pit of hell. If you know anybody that is in sex marriage, tell the person is heading to hell. If you know any person that is into homosexuality, the gay, the lesbians and the bisexuality, is heading to hell. The bestialism. You see, the person will say, it's not enough for a human to human. Let me now practice with the animal. He or she looks at everywhere nobody's at home, takes the animal, and starts having intercourse with an animal. God Almighty have mercy. And as he's having such things with the animal, the demons are rejoicing in hellfire. And God is sad. And then the person dies. And everybody celebrating has gone to heaven, not knowing that he's suffering in hellfire. And this is terrible, bestialism. And you see the way the love for the animal is so more intense than the love for a fellow human being. There's a problem. We're not saying you shouldn't have pets. We're not saying you shouldn't have animals around you as pets. But the love for the pet should not replace the love. The love for humans should not replace the love for the pet. And it's an instant a wish your the love for the pet should go. And there are things you don't do to do before your pet. You don't need to treat me care before your pet. That's why you don't have reasons to do anything with your pet. You say it's a pet, doesn't know anything now. Some of them have extrasensory perception. You don't do that. And you keep your nakedness away from the pet. That's why you have nothing with the pet. Pistialism. When you do such things, you're on way to hellfire. Repent. The seduction. The seduction. And all the luring. You like dressing. You want to dress to kill. You're dressed to kill. Your dress with your mama and granddad, a little exposed. It looks covered, but a little part of it is exposed. You dress to kill. And you split your, you know, your, 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 your skirt, dressing to kill. So that when you sit down, everybody sees everything there. What is it you are showing to the world that is new to people? Not knowing you're just exposing yourself. Nobody goes for a cheap thing. They go for things that are well covered, that are, that are expensive. Make yourself expensive. Make yourself inaccessible. Only accessible by your legitimate husband. Only accessible by your legitimate wife. And don't make yourself a cheap thing in the world. That the people that come after you, they just have a hit and run. They will leave you in their heart. And when they go behind you, this course, she was a cheap woman. He was a cheap man. And the Lord will save us. And the Lord will take the twerking of all forms. Your acts will dance in the church. To the glory of God, right? And the songs are going on. Instead of you to dance modestly, moderately, dance righteously, you are twerking your backside. You are twerking everything, and your mammary gland is falling off, and you say you are dancing to the Lord. Which Lord are you dancing? You are dancing to demons. As a matter of fact, the Lord opens your eye in that church. There are demons there, dancing and happy with you, the way you are doing it. You are twerking and turning your backside, and turning and shaking everything up, and the brothers are busy dancing, and they are still looking at you, and they are lost him, and some of them are even pouring on themselves. In the church! And they say they are dancing to the glory of God. And when you challenge them, they will say, uh -uh, when you come before God, you can dance the way you like so that God will not curse you. Like, don't you know what happened to that king? And when the person looked at him and was mocking the way he was dancing and so God, now that then the person was not like this and like that. No, no. Your intention of that twerking is to seduce the brethren over there. And I am I not even sure whether there are the success people that are also there looking at your backside, you running left and right, from Twitter right, right and right, and your normally ground doing all the rubbish, and the people are lost in instead of glorify the Almighty God. If you must twerk, for instance, if you must go trip naked to dance before God, why can't you do that in your closet? In a closed door. Nobody is there with you. You want to go naked to dance before God, beautiful. That's great. That's wonderful. Because your intention is to do it before God. Not when you are in the church and somebody challenges you and says, No, we can do everything before God. Did God say you should expose your nakedness? What are people to see? There are not your, the, the person is not your wife or your husband, and the person is not your child. Everybody must see. See what? So, as I dance, seen that glorifies Satan, the twerking of all forms. The unlike and physical prostitution. No, 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 no. Physical prostitution is 
it's widespread. It's it's it's, 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 it's evil. But mine is just online. And you tell the person to send you nude pictures. Just send me your nude pictures, please. No, we can't see now. Uh, on your way to hellfire. And then the sugar daddy and the sugar mommy practice. And then you want to attach yourself. You say, you're a student, you're in school. And you know, because I'm a student in school now, I need somebody. I need somebody that is the age of my father. I need somebody that is the age of my mother. And as a sugar mommy now, I need somebody that will be able to assist me. And then when I need the whatever, you are a liar. They don't need any assistance. You are depraved. You are morally depraved. And you are rotting in your inside. And the grace of God is not in your heart. You are looking for pleasure where there's no legitimate pleasure. You just want to explore. You just want to do evil. That's your excuse. Sugar mommy and sugar daddy practice a masturbation and the pornography. A masturbation. You know now, you know, I'm a single person. I'll be faithful the whole time. As long as we faithful the whole time, you know, it's not easy like that. Be faithful the whole time. And so for I need to check the porn on my phone. The Lord is watching you on your way to hellfire. I need to touch my body to get uh, to to to, uh, to to be able to achieve this kind of pleasure. Uh, achieve that kind of pleasure. Nobody's watching you on your way to hellfire. Wait for your time. When it is due time that you're married, you will get married, and the Lord will touch you, and the Lord will bless you, and the Lord will help you. And I, but Jesus is the reason why we are preaching. I gave my life to Christ, 5th June 1987. At about uh, seven forty-five p.m., it was on a Friday, and I'll be going to church the whole time. But on that day, I saw God's glory upon the pastor that preached from his face, and as he was saying and preaching the word of God of Psalm ninety-one, my heart was touched. And as he said, "Stand up now and surrender and talk to the Almighty God," I stood up. I knew, and I told myself, "This day will not pass me by." All the prayers I've been praying the previous month were just half truth prayers. Prayers I didn't mean, I didn't mean from my heart. So nothing happened. On that day, I gave my life to Christ. And I stood up to say, Lord, this thing and that thing that I know I used to do, I promise you I won't do them anymore. And I meant what I said. And that was the difference. I meant what I said. And that was the difference. And I prayed and read, I poured my heart to God. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. And the Lord Jesus came into my heart. And as I gave my life to Christ, you know what? I started serving the Lord, made my ways right. I never heard about restitution of doing the right thing. You know, I used to take, um, uh, when my mom said, go to the port to take uh, food and uh, uh, take maybe meat or something, maybe meat or beef. I would take some, put some under, put some, put some under the, the, the rice and put, and put and eat as much as I could eat. But when I gave my life to Christ, Nobody taught, it, taught me about mending your ways, right? I went to my mom and you see, uh, right now you're asking me to go and take food now, right? Okay, no, I'm not going to take any meat. Because you know what? For some time ago, I used to take like four or five meats now. And maybe you taught it to say, you want meat. Ah, my mom will say, oh no, I've had you, I've forgiven you. Go and take, don't worry. My heart was free. Not only that, and there used to be a devil in our house at that time, somewhere. And then she said, on the day that I was coming, I'm talking about many, many years ago, I wasn't married. Many, many, many years ago, I just finished uh, um, high school. Many, many years ago, it was 1987. And I said, as I was opening the door, I experienced power that I have never seen before, that I almost fell. But I heard myself, not to embarrass myself before you. And I recalled, I recounted, oh, that was the day I gave my life to Christ. When you give your life to Christ genuinely, even evil spirits will know something has happened. You don't, may not feel any difference from the way you are. Your complexion remains the same. The way you talk, they remain the same. Though you won't say some of those bad words you used to say. Your height remains the same. Everything about you remains the same. But spiritually, your name will be blotted from the book of death to the book of life. And then your heart will be circumcised. Your heart will receive grace to now know what is evil and what is right. And when she said that, oh, I recall. Mm, that was the day I gave my life to Christ. I never felt any power around me, but I knew that today, those things I used to do, I do them no more. I do them no more. And that was it. Today, you have the ample opportunity to give your life to Christ as you're listening to this broadcast. And when I say give your life to Christ, give your life to Christ sincerely and genuinely. And how do you do this? When I say pray, pray from your heart. And as you are praying, the Holy Spirit will be telling you, what about this? What about that? 
What about this and what about that? And then you'll be telling the Lord after I should that I will not do it again. I will stop it. I will not do it again. I will stop it. I will not do it again. I will stop it. When God sees your heart, you are sincere. He will visit you with his power. You will become regenerated. You now have the power of sonship or the power of daughtership. Wherever you are right now, I need to uh, bow your heads in prayer if that is best for you. If you wish to stand up, you can stand up. If you wish to sit down or lie down, you can do that, but your heart must be in this prayer. Talk to God. Give your life to Christ. Give your life to the Almighty God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because that is the main thing. That is the main thing. Give your life to Christ. Give your life to Christ. Give your life to Christ now. Give your life to Christ now. Ask Him to forgive you your sins. Ask Him to have mercy upon you. Promise Him you will not go back to evil again. Promise Him you will not go back to evil again. Promise Him you will not go back to evil again. Promise Him you will not go back to evil again. You say after me, Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins. Write my name in the book of life. I promise you I will not go back to my rotten life again. I promise you I won't go back to evil again. I want to serve you sincerely and I want to experience your power from on high. The power of regeneration. The power of salvation. I, don't, I've stopped, I want to stop pretending. I'll stop all the pretense, oh Lord. I won't truly want to serve you now. If I've said this prayer sincerely, the Lord I said you. For everyone that has prayed that prayer, Lord, write his one name in the book of life. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen and amen. While your eyes are still closed, before we go for today, let our mommy come around off and seal these blessings for you. God bless you as you come to the stage now. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the service. We bless your holy name for all that you have taught us today. We give thee all the glory. We ask, O oh Lord, that all you have taught us give us the grace to apply them in our daily living. Father, we pray that you give us the wisdom that was upon David that enabled him to negotiate with all that he negotiated with. Father, grant us such wisdom in the name of Jesus. Father, grant us the wisdom that is more than that of Daniel, the wisdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, that in our daily affairs, we will be able to apply wisdom and at the end of it all, we will get success in Jesus' name. Father, for those that have given their lives to you, preserve them in the kingdom. Help them to be nurtured in your word. Help them not to go back to the world. Establish them in your kingdom in Jesus' name. Blessed be the name of the Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening to the message. The blessings await you as you obey and pray along. For any inquiry, partnership and prayers, please check our YouTube page for contact as you click on the select icon. Please like, subscribe and click the bell to be notified on upcoming videos. And do not forget to share. God bless you.